much to Steph for setting the, the very large context. And I think my role here for the next little while is to sort of start to drill down and talk specifics here in the Bow Valley, uh, share with you, remind you a little bit of what we do know, and then share with you a little bit of where things are, some of the things that are proposed and uh, how we might want to think about them in the context of our long-standing uh, passion and concern for, for wildlife in this community. So I see a few people in the crowd that I recognize, but probably the thing that I really love about tonight is I see a lot of people I don't recognize. Um, so first of all, thanks so much for coming, and I also see a really nice cross-section of demographics, uh, all ages, and that's really nice to see as well. Um, so I'm going to spend just a, a couple seconds here uh, introducing myself. I've been a biologist in the valley for 25 years. Uh, I did help uh, write the Bow Corridor Ecosystem Advisory Group uh, Corridor, uh, Wildlife Corridor and Habitat Patch Guidelines, and those were reviewed in 2012. And a lot of basic principles we talked about there have only been uh, confirmed over time. And, and so that was a multi agency <coughs> effort that uh, Canmore then adopted in their, the town of Canmore in their municipal development plan. Um, as guiding principles for how we need to uh, conserve uh, corridors and patches over the long time, over the long term. Uh, I'm a full-time biologist with Parks Canada. I'm definitely not standing up here with my Parks Canada hat on, but I just I think it's important to know that that's how I make my living, and I, I am definitely up here not representing anybody. I have no clients, and I think it's really uh, important to know that I'm. I'm one of you, I'm one of many residents in this community that Steph laid out that uh, really values wildlife and I'm up here simply because I'm concerned. And I, I think it's really uh, important to emphasize a little bit what Steph said about this being uh, a huge part of the identity of our community. Um, we know uh, a large part of the reason we live here is because of how much we value wildlife. We also know we're living in a valley that's the most developed place in the entire world where grizzly bears still exist. And I think that should really be a red flag for us. We are very close to a threshold that nobody can ever truly identify where that pinpoint is, where it's gonna no longer be possible, but I think that's the context that we have to be thinking about all of this stuff in. We know we're a community and again, uh, through good leadership, with, uh, through our municipal council and, uh, uh, and past decisions. We're a community that does value this concept of wildlife corridors. And uh, kudos to the town of Canmore for, uh, uh, you know, for me to sort of stand back and now see the town of Canmore uh, arguing with, uh, with, not arguing, but trying to protect a shared wildlife corridor with the adjoining municipality and going to the municipal government board to, to have, ensure there's continuity between the two jurisdictions and that all the investments that the town of Canmore has made in wildlife corridors continue and aren't cut off by decisions that are made in the MD. I think that's, for me, that's one of the largest signs of progress when, you know, 10, 15 years ago, like Gareth said, we were going to town council meetings and for the first half of the meeting explaining what a wildlife corridor was. So uh, it's just great. We also know that there's quite a bit of uh, data out there, and I'll just spend one minute orienting you on this map. So I just, uh, this is from a uh, province of Alberta report. It's not great light, but it's wolf backtracking se sequences, winter 1998 to 2007. So in yellow, you have these sequences across the property, the Three Sisters property. Um, and then this is, down here is the Winton Valley. This is Dead Man's Flats. This is the Bow River, this is the Trans-Canada Highway. And uh, so you can see in the opaque, shadowy green, here is the, um, the designated wildlife corridor uh, as it exists up to here. This is a proposed wildlife corridor. You'll also note there's a disconnect, and that's I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as the night goes on. But basically the message here is, there's been a lot of work done in the valley to identify where wildlife do go. Uh, some of the areas that we've conceptually said we should, they should go don't necessarily line up with where they prefer to go. So to Steph's point, we're already pushing them into places 
that they don't necessarily uh, prefer. And this, this slide is uh, pretty much the same story. These are grizzly bear GPS locations. Um, the yellow ones are uh, non-berry season, so that would be fall and uh, spring, and then the orange ones are berry season. And you can kind of see the pathways come around the end of the Wind Valley and Wind Ridge. And you can see, again, here are designated corridors and where we're proposing corridors should go, and yet the preference is in other areas, and it's usually in these uh, lower line areas and uh, lower slope areas. And uh, we also know that uh, we did have a very collaborative process back in 2002. It was around the wildlife corridor that's currently around the unfinished golf course and a lot of work went in from a lot of people who were in this room and several people who aren't. And part of the thing that came out of that report is exactly what I just said. You know, these designated corridors aren't necessarily lining up with, uh, they were kind of drawn where uh, around to avoid where proposed development was. And so there actually was quite a bit of work done to improve the corridor around the unfinished golf course. And uh, one of the things that's potentially being pro proposed in opening up that area um, structure plan for the resort center is undoing a lot of this effort that was uh, done to protect that corridor, potentially. So this really, uh, if we boil down the critical wildlife corridors in this valley, in this valley they come down to uh, slope and width, and then human wildlife conflict. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about both those things. So this is my high-tech GIS system at home. <laughs> it's Google Earth. Uh, so now we're looking at the valley as if you had started hiking up. Um, Lady McDonald, or, 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 or above the Alpine Club. And you're looking across, you're, well, you're, you're basically standing on top of uh, Grotto Peak. And uh, I'm just wondering, Adam, do you mind fiddling with the lights for a second and just see if we can get the... Um, yeah, I don't mind being in the dark here a little bit, if you guys don't mind, so you can see it a bit better. So in red are uh, slopes over 25 degrees. And so again, you can see, especially down towards this end, which is the Smith Creek area structure plant. So it's that area east of Stewart Creek heading down to Dead Man's Flats on the Three Sisters side of the valley. And then this is the unfinished golf course here. You can see quite a bit of uh, high slope areas in there. And these kind of uh, differ from steep areas to actually these little cliff bands that cut through that area. And uh, so, so note that. And then, uh, just what I said is these, these are kind of the two main areas, just roughly, the Smith Creek Area Structure Plan on the left, and then the uh, Resort Center, the unfinished golf course portion of the Resort Center, which really are the two areas of concern and issue with uh, regard to wildlife corridors. Um, three sisters, so we also know, um, you know, where, or how do we know that slopes aren't working, of uh, steep slopes? Well, the, uh, the former owners of the Three Sisters uh, Village property, they had quite a bit of work that they did. Um, and these were some of the conclusions from their own report for a couple of years of their monitoring on the land. I don't think I need to read any of those to you. But um, again, pretty telling for how the animals are preferring areas lower down. And then there was uh, a report done by World Wildlife Fund, Lafarge were partners, government of Alberta, and they did uh, about 280 kilometers of winter tracking uh, in the snow, you know, these various species. And uh, just to help you kind of, really I want you to focus on this column here. And this is where 95% of the tracks were found the sequence is below, you know, what degree slope. So this, this basically says 95% of the Kugler tracks were below slopes of 30 degrees, and you can just work down the list. 95% of tracks were below slopes of 21 degrees for wolves, and so on. So again, you see uh, patterns there across all species. Then uh, 
this is uh, just a collation, or a collation of GPS locations. So these are animals that are just out on the landscape. There's no particular bias towards where you found them before. These are just basically pulled through in random time. And these are where they fell at different seasons um, and different species. So again, you can see cougar are, are spending you know, 68 to 65% of their time, depending on the season, below slopes of 25 degrees. Uh, bears, grizzly bears definitely in summer, 75% of the time. In winter, while well, they're actually going up high on steep slopes in fall to den. And then certainly for wolves, you see 96% in all seasons below those slopes of 25 degrees. So, and then uh, finally, this um, same story. This is, uh, this is over 15,000 kilometers of wildlife <laughs> tracking. Uh, collated across the Rockies from Jasper. Uh, this is done by a fellow by the name of Adam Ford, who uh, was a, a postdoc and now is working as a professor in the Okanagan for UBC. And he basically just plotted for these 15,000 kilometers of wildlife tracking that were done basically throughout the Rockies and Alberta. And again, you can just see, you know, wildlife use for all these different species really starts to drop off uh, the higher the slope you go. And there's definitely a dearth of use below uh, 20, or anything above 20 degrees. Now, you know, does no use happen? No, you, you're always gonna have animals uh, going outside. Uh, but I think the really important part for us to think about within the context of what Steph was talking about, which is we're trying to maintain a corridor uh, that's of international significance and when you think about that, it's those one-off movements of animals that are often not from this valley but are passing through from a population that have completely different genetic information that are then uh, dispersing to another area that's actually, from an evolutionary perspective, from a, a diversity perspective for genetic to avoid the inbreeding, those are the most important things. So we want to make sure we have a corridor here that's going to work for an animal that maybe isn't that habituated to humans, uh, that isn't maybe living right here in Canmore, but is coming from the deep backcountry of Banff National Park, and it's on its way to southern Kananaskis, and that's a hugely important movement in the long time scale of, of wildlife evolution. And it really is, the, the ability for those things to have happened in the past is why we see the beauty in these animal forms today that are so well adapted to their environment. If we cut that off, we're probably not going to see the effects in our lifetime, but they're going to happen in the future. So we, we need to keep the options open for the future. And then the other thing is the, the width of a corridor. And again, science kind of approaches these from the, the perspective of two concepts, zone of influence, which is really, you can actually measure how animals react to disturbances. Um, and the distance at which they react to disturbances. So, you know, an example would be, let's say an animal is on the other side of the creek here, and I go out to the side of the door and I start stomping my feet, and it buggers off. Well, the zone of influence for that animal is probably something around <coughs> 200 meters or more. And, uh, and again, it depends on the kind of stimulus, but uh, that's that concept. And the flight initiation distance in that particular example is the same thing because the animal actually took flight. But sometimes there's just a reaction and they don't flee. And so again, you can measure, you know, how much does it take for an animal to actually flee. And, and uh, so again, this has been done. Uh, there have been studies done. And it's from this that we can say, okay, if we want to have an animal to be able to get through undisturbed, we can actually base our decisions on how wide a corridor needs to be on that information of you know, what are the kind of distances where they can still get by when, say, the sound of adjoining roads or the sound of and smells of adjoining uh, housing developments, uh, they're still comfortable passing through. And again, uh, Dr. Adam Ford did a nice uh, job for us and he had a master's student help him out. And uh, they just summarized, again, this column is the zone of influence. And this column is all the studies they went. So they basically went to the scientific, existing scientific literature, uh, combed through it, 
and then uh, basically summarize it for us for these different species. And uh, I don't need to read you those numbers. But basically from that, um, you know, came up with the conclusion. So again, it isn't them. It's not them going out and looking at a few tracks on the land. I mean, this is extensive, wide research. And they basically said for wildlife corridors, you definitely want to be thinking about something over 450 meters. And, you know, as we saw, you definitely want to be thinking about something under a slope of 25 degrees. So, um, you know, those bull corridor ecosystem advisory group guidelines I was talking about that we worked on, if they were to apply on Three Sisters property and they don't, there's a kind of a, a clause in the, those that said they didn't apply to the Three Sisters property. But if they were to, and we were following them to T, the actual width of a corridor has to increase as the corridor length. And, and that's kind of just basic intuition. As an animal travels along, the longer it's traveling in a constricted area, the kind of more room you have to give it because it's spending more time rather than if you think of some of the highway underpasses in Banff, it's just a brief bottleneck. And they're probably not comfortable when they're going through there, but it's quick and it's over and it opens up and they can relax again. But when you're talking about an eight kilometer long corridor, if you were to go to uh, follow the guidelines of, of the BC, yeah, you'd be needing a corridor that'd be somewhere around 800 meters wide. So, you know, I think from my perspective, this idea of a 450 wide, uh, 450 meter wide corridor is already somewhat of a compromise from what the guidelines that are kind of our ideal guidelines uh, would dictate. So those are the kind of rough um, guidelines if you had to kind of wrap your head around numbers. And lo and behold, um, back in 2008, this is a, uh, it wasn't public until the, the previous owners of this same property went into re receivership and then this appeared in a court report. And this, uh, so again, now you're kind of looking, you've flown off Grotto Peak, you've got wings, <laughs> you're hovering above, right above the Three Sisters Corridor. Here's the Trans Canada Highway, here's the river, here's the existing development to Three Sisters. This is the unfinished uh, golf course here. Here's the Stewart Creek Golf Course. And you're hovering over and so this is basically one area that we're talking about. This is the, um, the Smith Creek area. This is the, uh, this is the corridor gap or the disconnect, if you will. This is the proposed Wind Valley corridor. Uh, this is the old 1998 corridor. And back then, the uh, provincial government department, which was called uh, Alberta Sustainable Resource Development, which is the equivalent of today's Alberta Environment and Parks, uh, quietly put this out with the landowner at the time and said, listen, if we want this to work, we need a corridor that's 450 meters wide below a slope of 25 degrees. So there's tremendous alignment there. Uh, this is what the province said in 2008, and it really hasn't uh, changed at all. And back when a lot of us were sitting in the same room, a lot of the same people were presenting in 2013, with Pricewaterhouse Cooper, we said, you know, what would make this community happy and satisfied is if we had a corridor that was 450 meters wide below a slope of 25 degrees. So it's definitely been a very consistent message, and it's been a message that I think the uh, current landowners who own this property uh, before 2008 and have definitely been engaged in the community uh, would have been well aware of when they decided to purchase it out of receivership. Uh, I mean, these are people who are tremendously successful business people. They do their research, and it's, this isn't a surprise. Carson, is that corridor the, the light green, dark green, or is it the red line? Yeah, so the red line, so the proposed corridor by the province back in 2008, and what it would look like if we were to have 450 meters below 25 degrees, the corridor would be down the slope, and this would be the bottom end, would be the red line. Right. And what you're seeing here is not the current development proposal. Uh, we don't, we, we're not sure what the current development proposal is, and, but these lot lines and so on are the previous, or the landowner at this time, it's their, their schematic. So don't pay attention to those. So those aren't even developed yet? No. Okay. Yeah, there's no development in here. 
current development, which is currently cleared, and Jessica, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it basically uh, comes to around here. Yeah, and that's, the, you call it... That's the across Valley Corridor. No, that, yeah. Either. Yeah, and I'm going to talk I about that in a minute. I wouldn't be able to comment. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, I'm almost done here. And we can really put up this is conversation. So what does that red line look if we fly back over to Grotto Peak? <laughs> <laughs> We're moving around tonight. And uh, again, you know, within the schematic of where the current quarters are mapped. Uh, well, the 450 degrees that's, or 450 meters wide below slope of 25 degrees, it isn't perfect, but that basically is what the proposed Wind Valley corridor is. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty good. Um, that red, this red line is basically that red line. So what we would need to see is the, the core come down to there. And then over on the, um, to keep with what the, with the hard core. And, the, and then this is roughly, so again, uh, I was actually sitting on the um, community advisory group uh, for the current development to help them come up with an idea and I stepped away from the process back in the spring but at the time when I stepped away and according to some maps that I've seen uh, there this is the currently proposed uh, corridor so down to the yellow line uh, by the developer um, and so the conclusion is it's pretty darn close how close it's basically 100 meters uh, so kudos to the developer, and I know this came through some previous discussions with the province, to bring it down from here. Um, I think we have to recognize that that involves private land, uh, so there's a cost to that, to the developer. We also have to recognize that there have been negotiations with the province to swap land out to compensate uh, in some of these lower parcels closer to the highway. I think that's a good thing. Um, to concentrate the development down slope so we keep the corridor. We're close, but again, if we're going to stick by these tenants that Stafford is talking about at the beginning, which is the precautionary approach, uh, to really go uh, with an approach that we are much more confident will work over the longer term, we need to push for that extra 100 meters. So, sorry, are we now talking about between the yellow line and the red line? That's all we're talking about on this sp specific one, yeah. 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 Yeah, sorry if you're not following me. It's great to have the clarification, yeah. Is that pretty clear to folks? Okay. And so uh, let's just jump over to the uh, unfinished golf course now. And this red line is really what was negotiated back through that 2002 process uh, in terms of a buffer for this corridor. Uh, recognizing that a large portion of that corridor is pretty steep uh, and you have these incursions. So there was recognition that this was going to be developed as a golf course and they started. Um, that golf course is a seasonal use and so you might have some of that seasonal disturbance from people and you have these animals affected by that zone of influence. But for the winter uh, this could be, uh, this could effectively buffer this corridor which wasn't deemed to be adequate on its own and that was uh, a line that was decided and again it's not exact this is this is homeschool GIS out of Karsten's basement <laughs> uh, but this it basically was said you know over the long term maybe you could have some golf cabins here but this needs to be kept open as a buffer for the wildlife corridor so again um, you know the current we, we, we know that there's interest in the, in the current landowner uh, in, in considering development on that entire unfinished golf course with, with uh, various forms of housing pods. So again, uh, what's the difference? Well, in this particular case, uh, if that was kind of where the developer was proposing the line, is on the, this side. The difference between that is about 350 meters. So it's more significant. Uh, I wouldn't say it's any less or more important. You know, we, we need to think these, about these things as a whole. We're talking about wildlife movement corridors, when animal 
basically could be entering from the Banff National Park end and exiting on the Kananaskis end. And uh, you need to have some uh, good conditions throughout for it to work. It's a continuity issue. All right, so that's what it looks like as we zoom out. Um, those differences are really what uh, things are boiling down to. Now I just want to briefly take you to another part of this. And uh, so this corridor, which is meant to provide animal movement across valley coming into the Bow Flats area, which is a pretty rich area along the river. Um, this corridor got adjusted uh, pretty recently. There's the wildlife underpass, Stewart Creek underpass. There's about 600 animal passages there of all species happening per year, according to the province's data. Uh, this corridor got adjusted uh, pretty recently through a, a, a process where that, that underpass got centered, if you will, and, uh, and it allowed uh, development uh, into this edge here. Uh, so long as it was moved out this way, and, and, and that didn't meet with a lot of opposition. Since that time, well, really no opposition, uh, and I think that proves, and it proved to town council that when there's a good proposal and people believe it's sounded, it can, it can actually go through quickly and without any, uh, any concern expressed. And I think the current uh, developer can agree with that as well. Uh, but what happened since then is the 2013 flood came through and uh, we got uh, a whole new map that we need to work with called the flood risk map and it uh, turns out that that uh, flood risk um, comes down uh, into the, it, it, it closely follows where the, um, no, let me, just, let me just think this through, make sure I get this right. Yeah, the flood risk comes down uh, pretty much um, into this area, which rendered both the corridor, Cross Valley Corridor, and this flood risk area undevelopable. And so I know, it, you know, there's been some discussion with the uh, landowner right now. Well, if we could just move the corridor over a little bit more so that it overlaps with the flood risk, we could actually have more developable land here. And along with our proposal is, you know, we'll pay for and have built another wildlife underpass to uh, replace this one. And, uh, and so again, that's, uh, I'm not going to say that's good or bad, but I can say that's going to affect the 600 animals that have grown accustomed to use the existing uh, underpass. And I think that's... Uh, that's something we all have to consider, is those past patterns and what we're asking wildlife to do in a valley and adjust in a valley that already is a maze for them. And so when I was uh, sitting on the community advisory group, I said, well, you know, I think I have a fairly open mind. I think a lot of the constituency I was representing have an open mind. How about this? How about you do that, but you actually give up some of that additional land you get by doing that and you compensate that disturbance to wildlife by instead of having a clear line here, and you, you still build your, your other uh, underpass, but you actually do it like this so that you have a flaring corridor, you have two underpasses, and maybe you actually increase the connectivity across valley and you still get some of that extra developable land. So that's another uh, idea that's floating out there and I think that we all need to think about as things start to uh, solidify in what uh, might come forward here in the next um, few weeks or months. And then just before I end here, I want to talk a little bit about human-wildlife conflict. Um, you know, you can have the best designed corridor in the world, and if it's infused with people constantly, and they're disturbing that zone of influence and that flight distance, it's happening right in that corridor, and all your investment is forgotten. And so something we have to wrap our heads around in this community, and we already have started, um, is, is you know, training ourselves and being able to constrain ourselves and realizing that we actually do have to set, when we set aside a wildlife corridor, it doesn't help to just draw lines on the map and say, we're not gonna develop in it. We actually have to monitor and regulate our own activities. 
uh, in there. And so I know, uh, you know, there's various discussions going on right now. And uh, this is, and, and some of them are around fencing uh, to keep both animals from coming in to uh, some of the new, newly developed areas, but also, quite frankly, to uh, minimize the amount of human incursion into the corridors and control them to set crossing points. Um, and I just put this slide up because I've, I've learned more than I ever imagined I would around fencing, because this is our bison paddock in the back country. Um, and, and part of my work has been looking at wildlife permeability of different fence designs these last two years. Um, and uh, quite frankly, when it happens in the context of this discussion, what I find is people forget the entire front half of this talk and all the importance there is in the actual land area and they immediately jump and we all get focused on the fencing and thinking about how that's going to affect things and we just focus on the fencing. And to me it's tremendously disappointing because again, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part and parcel, it's two things we have to do. We have to provide the animals with the space they need to be able to get through this valley in an undisturbed fashion. And I think I've kind of laid out what I know and what the literature is saying on that pretty clearly. And then we have to control the human use, but it's almost, it's, it's a weird phenomenon. I think it has something to do with human nature, but as soon as the fencing stuff gets mentioned, it's like the first half of the conversation just vaporizes. And we need to talk about these two issues and come up with solutions together. Because otherwise, neither of them are going to work. We can do our best effort at either one, um, and, and it's not going to work. So I'm not going to uh, say what I suggest is a good or bad thing. The human use issue is definitely one we have to tackle. Uh, what I've uh, been disappointed in in this conversation so far uh, with the developer is that there has been a suggestion of if we, it has been the emphasis on the human wildlife and a bit of a de-emphasis on how do, we, how do we merge those two, that yellow and that red line, how do, we, how do we bridge that gap? And I think that's almost the first conversation we have to have. We need to figure out where the line is and then decide, okay, is that gonna be like a hard boundary? Is it gonna be a soft boundary? What are we gonna do? What's that line gonna look like? And uh, Boulder was the consultant with, um, the previous uh, landowner, which was PricewaterhouseCooper when it was in a receivership. And PricewaterhouseCooper, for those that you didn't know, they actually put forth a proposal that Boulder helped them work on and did an environmental assessment for, and it included a proposal for fencing. The proposed corridor alignments were different, but there was this fencing. And, uh, and there are a lot of questions. The town actually uh, hired an independent consultant to kind of look at the Boulder report and, and say, you know, is this good? Are there questions that remain unanswered? And it turns out around the fencing there was a lot of unanswered questions and they included who will pay, who will maintain it. Uh, tr tremendous cost, the fence that's going, uh, being replaced in Banff, you've probably seen it if you've driven to Banff uh, lately, that's in, uh, I think it's $45 million project this year alone. Um, I'm not suggesting that's what it would cost for this, but it's pretty big cost output. And that's a maintenance project, right? There's an existing fence in place, and it's 30 years now, later now, and it's a maintenance project. Um, so if we're gonna do development that requires fencing, what's that future burden of maintenance? Where's that gonna fall? Who's gonna pay for that? Who'll maintain it? What happens if animals get in? I've spent a lot of my career as a park warden. I've gone to a lot of calls. We have a 24-hour shift seven days a week. I've been called out at night to deal with elk, bears, you name it, that have got on the wrong side of the highway fence in Bath. And it can sometimes be a pretty stressful experience, both for the responders and the animal, getting them back on the right side of the fence. And it can often take a team of six or seven people once you bring in traffic control. Uh, it's going to happen. It's, you can build the best fence and it still happens. Grizzly bears can climb those fences. Um, what's going to happen if it, if it happens here? And then who's going to be liable if something goes wrong? Uh, and what about uh, the existing golf course? Is that going to get fenced too? And you know, like once you start building a fence, where does it end? Is basically the, those are the questions. 
And will it actually deflect wildlife into other unfenced areas of the town? You know, when Banff Park started the highway, uh, they did it in phases. And we actually kind of moved the problem down the valley a lot of the time. And the wildlife just went around the fence at the end and then got hit there. And fortunately, over many tens of years now, it's been completed all the way out to Lake Louise. And there's good use of underpasses and overpasses. So those were questions not raised by me. Those were actually questions posed by the independent consultant. Um, so I'm, just, I'm done here, but I think the, the key message from my standpoint, we're going to open up to discussion, is you know, in the coming weeks and months, we need to measure all the proposals that might come forth against that, uh, that 450 meter red line. That's, uh, in my opinion, that's the standard we need to pursue. And we need to ensure that the hard work of that collaboration, uh, even though it was uh, 14 years ago, the basic principles of flight distances, zones of influence for animals, none of that has changed. That buffer that everybody works so hard for, it, it's, it hasn't turned into a bad thing, it's still a good thing. So thank you very much.